and web transcript. Thank you for that. Okay, so you should see transcripts if you um, turn them on at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And, um, oh yeah, the important thing, <laughs> Dennis Denman is here. Dennis, it's so nice to see you. Um, and I will introduce you as Director of Student Leadership at Central, even though you have a new job now as the Director of EDI at South. Uh, I love to believe that your heart is always still at Central. And Dennis is here to talk about first-generation students and the insecurity of spaces of higher education. Dennis, take it away. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you all for having me. Can you hear me okay? Awesome, that's great. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so honored to be with you all yet again uh, for another amazing COSI talk. Again, thank you, Katie. Uh, and even shout, shout out to Kimberly Tate Malone uh, for really uh, taking on the COSI series, keeping it going in all of the transitions and pandemic and Thursdays, all of that and more. So thank you so much. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, again, you all know me, Dennis D. Uh, that's me. I swear I need to put that on a shirt. I keep saying that so much. Um, but uh, yes, today I am the Director of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion here down at South, uh, formerly the Director Director of uh, Student Leadership, uh, helping our wonderful student government folks still get their BOT reports in. So I still help uh, and have a few obligations left at Central. One of the, these, this presentation being one of them. So really excited to be uh, with you all today. Um, I, um, I'm excited and I um, wanted to tell you how I got here today, but also um, wanted to take a moment of silence just to uh, pause and reflect um, in addition to our land acknowledgements and labor acknowledgements. We know that we did have a tragedy here in the city of Seattle, a high school student down in Ingram um, was shot and uh, killed. Um, and so that could be weighing on a lot of people's hearts and minds today. So we'll just take a moment of silence. Thank you for that. Um, yes, so much to share. I only have, you know, 50 Zoom minutes to get it done. Um, and so I originally had a really cute slide deck for you all. It was called the insecurity for me, but then I also wanted to make sure I'm focusing it on my topic and really trying to have a conversation this second time around. Um, so I have a few slides that I'm gonna show you and then they're gonna disappear because I do wanna talk to you all. Um, and have a conversation um, as I get my, my wonderful Zoom windows together. Um, again, happy first gen uh, week. I think as we thought it back at Seattle Central, uh, where we have been celebrating, just celebrating and uh, recognizing our first gen students and employees. Um, and so I hear that we had a great celebration in person for the first time that I, of course, missed. Um, and then we had some amazing workshops as well. And so this kind of books in um, just kind of our week together, uh, really just focusing and just having conversations about how to support, how to navigate, um, and how to just be, uh, how to support first year students, but also just how to navigate this wonderful world we call higher ed. Um, in a lot of ways, I think we forget about first gen students, and I'll unpack that a little bit more um, in a second. Um, but just trying to uh, make space, and that's what we've been able to accomplish. So shout out to all of my good friends down at Entrio, uh, El Sam Mesa, I think Amoda was on board this year, and Apizu was on board this year, and of course all the wonderful hardworking folks in uh, student leadership um, to really carry on the the energy and the celebration for our first gen students. Um, with that, I'm going to get to my screen that I just got to find because I got got some screens on. Give me two seconds. It was here and then it went away. There it is. Bam. You can see my screen. It's probably me on it. <laughs> awesome. Um, I am going to go into presentation mode because someone out there hates it. So I made a little flyer. I have social media friends who are like, what about this? I hear you're presenting. So anywho, uh, the insecurity of spaces of higher ed uh, for first gen students. I kept changing the title and then it was uh, the other slide deck has its insecurity for me. 
Um, as some of you know, I do a lot of pop culture references and I watch a lot of TV and I weave all of it into my presentations. Um, but yes, um, cute blurb. Thank you, Katie, for making sure I got it to you in time. Um, the overview of my talk on these next uh, 50 Zoom minutes, um, how we got here today, um, my whole unpacking of sometimes how I feel that we forget about our first year students and surprisingly, even in community college world. Um, but I think because we all, a lot of us already are first gen, it's just that thing you don't um, identify with. Um, how I navigated higher education, um, my UCLA experience, um, for those of you who don't know, what UCLA for undergrad, um, it was rough. And then it was really my grad school experience where I was like, oh, I, I got this. I know how to do education, higher ed, this is cool. And I'll walk through that um, with you all. Um, some student support, support systems, um, just if we had any students in the call and we're interested in how to do all this, but also teaching strategies. I know a lot of faculty um, are on the call as well and have these questions in the back of their head. Um, and I'm gonna stop there. Um, the rest of my slides, you'll see them in a second. But again, I wanted to see all of you and not just my slide deck. Uh, so again, um, again, I introduced myself. How did we get here today? Um, it really was by accident slash, I was uh, signing up our student leaders for a COSI talk six months ago. Um, so they were gonna do a COSI talk. And then I was like, oh, well, I always kind of wanted to do a COSI talk, but what in the world would I talk about? Uh, we somehow met and figured out uh, how to, uh, narrow my topic down to first generation stuff. And at the time I did a presentation on how to being a first generation uh, professional, what does that mean, right? There's no manual for any of this. Um, in summary, um, they're not gonna fire you, you have the job. I had this whole vision that they're gonna drag me out of here, kicking and screaming, they're gonna figure out, you know, I'm not supposed to be here. So that imposter syndrome, um, other lessons from that uh, was, uh, you know, you are enough. Uh, this office that I was in, it is for me and I know how to be a professional, right? Um, as well as again, um, that you're not in this by yourself. Um, you have support systems, just like you had as a student, you have to use them now in your professional network. Um, and so I think somewhere in the Q and A of all of that presentation, um, Someone had shared like, oh, well, did this from a, you know, faculty teaching lens. Uh, what advice do you have for us in terms of just helping first gens out? And I think I just kind of said, oh, well, that's its own closely talk. Uh, but here's what I think. And then it was just like, great, we're going to bring you back to have your own closely talk about that. So again, try, I'm helping our um, instructional friends, but also our staff, student staff uh, friends, uh, just kind of navigating figuring out how to support your first gen student who might be in your classroom or might be in your office or might be a part of your program. Um, so that's kind of how we got here. So here we are today. Um, I think there was another request for like, oh, how do you navigate hiring and all that stuff as a first gen professional? I'm like, that's another go see. So we'll definitely get me back here to talk about that because I have a lot of thoughts. Um, so with that, um, I want to talk about, um, and I'm looking at my cheat sheet that you can't see, um, how higher ed sometimes forget about first-gen students. I think, again, uh, particularly in community college, I think I'm making an assumption, but generally speaking, a lot of us already identify as first-gen. We just don't think about it because we don't have to think about it and or the assumption is everybody's kind of first time. And that's kind of true. But also when you have a first gen week, it's like, oh, wait, I can meet other people who clearly have no idea like I do. We just showed up to the front door and said, hey, I'm going to try this thing out. Yes, it's amazing just to see students when they connect. And uh, even when faculty and staff, when we were doing uh, first gen week and really kind of going around like, hey, are you first gen? Are you first gen? Like, oh, wait, you're first gen. Oh, my gosh. Like we didn't. It's 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 something it's an identity that we think about well it's an identity that we don't think about maybe because it's not a salient identity uh, you can't just look around or there's not a button that says first gen uh, there now might be some buttons that say first gen courtesy of the hand of pleasing folks but the point is uh, we don't necessarily have these open conversations like yes i was the first in my family to go to college and try to figure it out and i didn't know what financial aid was um, i just enrolled and i got a scholarship maybe or something was taken care of and i just showed up um, and maybe this will work out and so for a lot of us it worked out, right? And so how do uh, we tell the story? Uh, how do we make it work for our students who are sitting in front of us or students who are meeting us at the front counter or even our, uh, more so our family, right? Uh, me being first gen, um, 
me being first gen, uh, the hope and the goal is that I'm not the only person in my family, right? So how do we give back? How do we share this knowledge? How do we now just say, hey, community college, um, university, career, it's all for you. Let me show you how to do it. Um, and so hopefully uh, I won't be the only uh, person in my family in college. I can enroll family members and more. Uh, and again, we have wonderful uh, Seattle colleges anywhere. We can just kind of walk in the door and let's get you enrolled. Um, so I definitely wanted to promote that slash I was told to make sure I made that announcement. Um, it does not stop with me or, uh, yeah, it just doesn't stop with me. The hope is to bring others along um, and really, uh, try to just kind of navigate and really break down the lingo, right? Um, and I'll get to that later. Uh, my UCLA experience undergrad, it was, uh, it was good and then it was bad. It, it was good in the sense that I applied to college. Um, I, I'm from, originally from Los Angeles, if you did not know, uh, South Central would be exact. So the hood, yes. Um, I went to Crenshaw High School. If you know anything about Crenshaw High School, it's the infamous Crenshaw High School. I was a student body president. Um, so again, today's modern reference is now what uh, all American on CW. Um, and that's my neighborhood and that's my school. And I'm like, oh, I know that's not the real school, but it's over there. Um, so um, I'm always excited to see my, my community on TV for good things. Um, and sometimes not the breaking news, but that's not the point. Um, so I went to school. I always knew I was smart and like I was into books and I was, you know, nerdy and I love the library. So shout out to all the librarians. You all know where all the secrets of the world are. They're in the library. Just talk to a librarian. Um, I knew I was going to go to school out of the hearts. Um, I knew I was going to go to college. Um, I knew, I think I knew colleges existed. I knew community colleges existed. Um, UCLA, I, I applied because someone helped me. Um, we had a, like a recruiter person, advisor person. Um, he was helping and I was like, sure, I guess I'll check the box UCLA because clearly you're from UCLA and it'd be rude to not put your college on the application. Um, UC system, if you don't know, you can pick four of the nine, I believe, UCs. So I was just checking boxes off. I said, oh, well, I better check off UCLA because that would be rude. Um, fast forward, I got to UCLA. Um, when I got the letter, I did not believe it was true. Um, and AKA, I got the letter and an email. So that could have, no. I got it in my inbox that one day and I already immediately knew that this is the wrong Dennis Denman. Um, as I know, and I have accepted, I my name on paper, Dennis Denman, is a whole vibe, right? I don't think you always put this face to my name. I know that from professional experience, interview experience, and more. So I'm like, okay, they got the wrong one. So I got my acceptance letter. I didn't tell anybody about it for like five days. And when I did tell someone, it was my college counselor. And I kind of whispered it to her like, hey, I have to tell you something. I got in UCLA and she's like, why are we whispering? Uh, I was like, cause I think it's a mistake. It's the wrong guy, clearly. Um, and so the college counselor, she had already known that I had got in because apparently they know things. Uh, but she's like, let's celebrate this. But again, I was kind of like, no, there's so many hard working other students at this school. Like I did not deserve to get in UCLA. People are mad when they, they're gonna be mad when they find out I, got in UCLA. Uh, but again, it was the college counselor's encouragement. Like, goodness, you got in UCLA. You're brilliant. You're smart. I think I was like number seven in my school or whatever. Um, and, but I was like, I'm number seven. What about number one? Um, anywho, got to UCLA. Loved it. It was great. The first year, though, wasn't awesome. Um, transition from Crenshaw High. Uh, first year, uh, on my own, trying to be, a, well, actually, I don't have enough trying to be, live my life story. Um, my first quarter, um, again, I still came in with that imposter syndrome, like they're going to find out. They got the wrong Dennis Denman. I know they got the wrong Dennis Denman. So my first quarter, I was just always anxious, like, they're going to find out. They're going to find out. They're going to find out. Not gonna, I don't belong here. I don't belong here. I don't belong here. So that first quarter, it was just a lot of like hiding and like, oh, I hope no one figures out that I'm Dennis Denman, the Dennis Denman, because um, that's going to be bad. Um, I got over that my first quarter, but um, and so I, I'll give context. My first quarter, it was a summer quarter. I was a part of a, a transitional program, which I loved. But again, I was just anxious. Like I didn't put anything up in the dorm. I didn't put, I didn't get settled. I was just like, because they're going to kick me out. They're going to find out. Wrong one. Get out. 
Um, and so my second quarter, which was original, was uh, my original fall quarter, uh, was my first real quarter. As you all know, summer is summer and the fall is real. <laughs> um, um, no disrespect, but um, fall quarter, I received uh, my first F, my first D, and my first C minus or C. Um, and so I didn't know what happened. I was like, I've never had these grades a day in my life. I am Dennis Stimler from Crenshaw High School. I was number seven in my class. How did I get an F? Uh, my writing skills were the greatest, but I was in charge. I wasn't in charge. I was on school newspaper. So people were reading my stuff. How am I, you know, that wasn't the greatest. Uh, my math skills were not awesome. Um, and that one science class I had no business taking because I thought it was what you did. The point is math and I, I didn't realize I had, you know, maybe low skill sets, aka my high school didn't prepare me as much as I thought it did. Um, and so I was had an F, had a D, had a C. These are all bad things. I was already having the anxiety, like they're going to find me out. They're going to kick me out, drag, dragging, kicking and screaming. Um, and then I have all these bad grades. And then you have the weight of like, oh, my gosh, I'm letting my community down and my family. I don't want to go back home to stay on my aunt's couch because that would just be devastating. Right. Um, so the first quarter, it was scary, um, both in reality because of the grades, but also um, the family the community I've let all these people down my school like oh uh, uh, what is gonna happen um what happened is I made it to a third quarter which I guess is winter um I was put on academic probation so that was another like oh no I've never been on academic probation but again as you all know um academic probation is there to help us and support us um I definitely had to uh enroll in well in well I think yeah, there was a student success class. Um, I had to meet my advisor like every week and I had to go to tutoring. Um, and so I'm always grateful for our tutoring resources um, for us learning support center uh, because I fall quarter, I wasn't going to tutoring um, because I was smart. I did not need to go to tutoring because I'm smart. I'm number seven in my class, right? But that is the wrong mindset. Tutoring is there to support you. And so as a first generation, student you have to schedule tutoring um, just like you schedule your classes you have to schedule tutoring great now you got classes you're going to go to tutoring um, and so tutoring is really what saved my butt um, in addition to my wraparound source resources you know now I know the word wraparound resources but um, it was advising um, it was tutoring um, it was again my other students who were also anxious from my neighborhood like oh we're all going to get kicked out we have to stay in this together so before the posse program was the posse program I found my little posse and we were just determined to not get figured out and then having to pack up all of our stuff and take the tragic drive um, or walk back home um, actually yeah Bus. I bus all of my four years at UCLA. I, I, well, at least I didn't. I lived on campus, but I always uh, from South LA to West LA. It's like a whole different city. Uh, there's a one-hour bus commute uh, from my neck of the woods to UCLA, and so that's how I got home when I needed to go home. Um, but I'm getting off. Well, no, I'm telling my story, so this is good. Um, so winter quarter, um, I just knew I was on my way out. Sorry, fall quarter, because I had all those bad grades. I knew they were going to kick me out. I said, I'm going to take the terrible walk home. Third quarter, I was on the academic probation. Um, and at spring quarter, I think I got off of academic probation. So all of the resources helped. And then I, I kind of figured it out. You got to go to surgery. You got to go to advising just because uh, I just need to talk to somebody this week so they can tell me to calm down that I know what I'm doing, right? Um, I successfully made it to my second year. Um, of uh, undergrad. However, um, I had to take English 101. This would, this would probably be the, my fall quarter, second year. This would probably be my third time taking English 101 because I could not pass the class. And so that was kind of devastating. And so somewhere in the curriculum, if you can't get out of English 101 by the, the, the second year, they kind of have to let you go. Um, so that was also devastating because I could not uh, pass. I was writing and instructors were helpful and I, I was doing the best I could, but they're like, yeah, you're still at a C. We need you to get a B, um, says the college. Um, that's when I uh, learned the importance of office hours and that office hours for first generation college students that's not really optional. You need to go because that's how instructors help you. That's how they look out for you. That's how they give you that extra attention that you definitely need. They can't do that 
in a large class setting, office hours, you know, it's five students sometime. Um, that's where they definitely get to know you and work with you. Um, and so um, I had to take English at least three times uh, or I was out. So the pressure was really on it. Every paper had to be great. But again, writing centers, tutoring centers, going back to advising, having a study buddy, going to office hours, um, that kind of saved my butt. Um, I'm a much better writer now. I did get out of uh, English 101 and passed. I was thrilled. I was excited um, because I was just always stressed all the time. Um, my third year was the best year ever because I had a better handle on grades. Um, I had uh, supportive mentors. I got more involved on campus. Um, that's how I got into student life and all the entire ed, um, but that's another cozy for another time. Um, um, I had an academic advisor who, again, we had built relationships. I was just in his office just because those days where I just wanted to cry and also those days where I just wanted to talk about, hey, I don't feel like I'm worthy enough. Are you sure you all got the right dental student? And it's like, dental student, chill out. Stop doing that. Thanks. So I wasn't worried. Um, my fourth year, um, so third year was the best year. Fourth year, um, somewhere in the middle of all of it, and I think it was just really uh, the stress of like, oh, crap, I'm about to graduate. Um, I was having bad anxiety and panic attacks real bad um, to the point where I had to drop classes and then they sent me to the counseling center and then somewhere in the middle of that they said I had ADHD and then I'm like wait a minute wait a minute wait a minute I have ADHD wait a minute wait a minute I'm doing Stimlin number seven in my class Crenshaw High how do I now have ADHD? And again, just kind of dealing with this diagnosis, but not dealing with it, but I'm just having a little panic, anxiety. Um, how do you just get through all of that, right? Um, so as I was preparing for the presentation, I was unpacking all of the years. I was like, oh, this is really traumatizing. Ah, how did I survive all this? Um, I got out of UCLA in four years, to my surprise. <laughs> uh, but again, it was really relying on those support systems, those resources, um, and never really uh, giving up. As much as I wanted to give up and I cried at home, often talking to my aunt and my, um, really my aunt, she took care of me. Um, just saying, I think I'm ready to come home. I don't think I can do this. I, I can't graduate. I'm gonna be a failure and again. She was very supportive and just listened to me um, and be that great parent, right? Um, I got out. Um, I was supposed to make a comment about the ADHD. Uh, I'm never not gonna say don't get checked out. Definitely get checked out. Um, I think I was prescribed medicine. Um, I tried the medicine. I didn't like how the medicine made me feel. It was just either too much or I just felt like real zombie-ish. Um, so I stopped taking medicine. But for some folks that need the medicine, I'm never saying don't you know, do what you gotta do to take care of you. Um, it didn't make me feel great. So I just had to figure out different strategies to cope and get through my stress and my strain. Um, got out of UCLA, it was awesome. It was great. Fast forward to, oh, here's grad school. And I was very much like, no, I'm not doing grad school. Did you not just see how traumatic my undergrad was? I'm never going back to school ever again. Um, and look at me now. Uh, got into my uh, grad program. And I think that's when the light kind of went off that I felt like I was that I had actually a hand on higher education even though it was bumpy um grad school again because I'm like oh my gosh we're writing 20 page papers on leadership and management which I hate till this day but I can tell you everything about leadership everything about management every theory because we had that paper it was dreadful in the program and I cried so much but um it was grad school that really they changed the way I thought in terms of seeing myself I always felt myself as a at a deficit, um, as you all know, educators, deficit thinking, you know, the theory. But it was really my instructor in grad school who just kind of said it real blank at the beginning of the term. Um, hey, everybody, you already have an A. You already have an A. You already have an A. You just got to keep it. So do the work, keep the A. And that just kind of shift my whole mindset on like, wait, why didn't they tell us this in undergrad? If we already have the A, then why does undergrad make us feel like we already got an F and we got to build up to getting this A and 100% and then my classmates are doing better than me and I'm just like, whoa. Um, and so grad school was so much chiller when I think the instructor just kind of leveled maybe the playing field um, to just let everybody know you got an A, you just got to do the work. And yes, it's a lot of busy work, but do the busy work, you get to A. Um, as you all, well, I don't want I want to assume that some folks know um, grad school, um, it's a more advanced uh, degree, I guess, and I got a master's in education, if you're wondering. Um, but more so, it's your interest 
it on your specific topic. It's not as generalized as maybe undergrad or maybe your major, or maybe you want to learn more about your specific major in more detail. So um, you're in grad school because you're really interested in that topic. So for me, it was higher education and leadership. Um, and so I was really interested, but it was so refreshing to hear the instructor was like, hey, you all have an A, so you don't like chill out. Um, other uh, things that, you know, you depended on, you know, group projects, as much as I hated them, I loved them because I got to meet other students and hear from them. And they also might have had tragic undergrad stories or experiences. Here's how they navigated first, uh, being a first gen or just being a first gen student. And now, you know, new category, first gen grad student. Again, I'm looking for a manual. My family can't really help me. I don't really have friends to tell me. You just show up and you kind of do like you did undergrad. But again, my undergrad reference was I did awful, so no. Um, so just finding those other uh, partners, friends, study buddies, all that and more. Um, if there's any students on the call, you always bring snacks your first day of class because everyone likes the person who brings snacks. And then you simply start passing out your phone number slash can I text you? I know it's a little uncomfortable and super creeper at first, but this is how you establish your buddy system. These are the people that you're going to call slash can we figure out notes, not copying off each other. That's plagiarism, but let's work smarter, not harder. But again, I didn't learn all these things in undergrad. I learned them in grad school when it was like, smaller group of people, more focused content. And I'm just, you know, even like, why don't we teach these skills now? Uh, why do I have to wait till grad school and get a whole master's degree and more debt um, to figure out how to be a good, successful first-gen student? Um, so yes, uh, thank you for those comments. I saw them, but I can't open them because, you know, this Zoom screen. Um, I say all that to say, Oh yeah, I'm just sticking to my point, I love it. I'm um, saying all that to say, again, uh, for those students trying to figure it out, there's tricks to it. You just gotta be open to uh, putting yourself out there like, hey, I'm a first gen student. I have no clue what I'm doing, somebody please help. And literally everybody will help you. You just gotta be able to ask for help. Again, students, it's really hard to ask for help and I'm the king of not asking for help. I will be sick. And I've literally had COVID before I finally asked somebody for help um, because I'm used to doing it on my own. I'm independent, I can do it. Um, I gotta be really be sick and I gotta really have COVID to really ask for help. And I even struggle with that today in my own professional journey. Like, okay, I know I wanted to do this and I should have just said, hey team, I need help getting this done, but I'm used to not asking for help. So that's, it's important to ask for help. Put yourself out there, ask for help. Um, as for folks uh, looking to, um, well, yeah, all the stuff they, I wish they would have tell students. Um, yes, ask for help being one, um, go to tutoring. It's not uh, optional, it's required. Um, and I think um, explaining some of our resources around campus, um, I appreciate my, um, well, explaining resources, not simply just pointing them out. Here is the library. Here is learning support. Here is accessibility. But thank you for pointing that out. I still have no clue on how to actually use these resources. Um, and it's like, oh, great. And again, maybe instructors, maybe you could do that, but maybe you can walk us on over to that resource and let them do their spiel. Um, but I think I always knew where things were, but I didn't know how to engage or how to figure it out. Um, do you just go to the library to like study and you know be quiet? Because who wants to do that? No, you go to the library to ask for all the research help and more. But I didn't know how to really use my library until grad school. And I'm like, this would have been helpful five years ago. Um, so things that I just wish uh, we could unpack and do for students. Uh, I'm gonna go back to my slide because I think that's where I have some of my strategies. And then I'm gonna open it up to you all uh, to have a conversation. Um, going back to, yes, uh, the stuff I wish we'd tell students. Um, I walked you through my undergrad. That's me, a picture. This is graduation. This is a very exciting day because this is graduation photos time and it's just a hopper. Uh, these are some of my friends who got me through it. Um, and I had to dig out of my Google folder photos for that. I was like, oh, I forgot we did this. Um, but also, more importantly, the strategies um, or maybe Dennis's tips uh, for helping our first-gen students. Um, um, again, I've talked about explaining resources. Um, 
well, no, let me just go in order. Um, again, it's important to learn something about students that want to build that relationship because I'm not coming to ask you for help. You didn't ask me <laughs> what my name is, favorite color, uh, did I like Beyonce today or something. You got to find something um, to connect with students. Uh, helping uh, develop group study or just kind of those group skills. I know at the central campus, we're working on that collaborative uh, learning outcome um, in this upcoming future. And so um, my uh, candid advice when I was asked, what about you know teamwork, those collaboration skills? I think this the pandemic years have taught us, yes, we're collaborating because we have like Google and we're all working on a document, but nobody is teaching us like how to work in a group we just know we don't particularly like groups and so we need someone to help us like great you paired us and put us into groups together awesome and i guess you gave us a group project and some of us hate it some of us love it we all know there's going to be that one person that maybe falls off and then that one person already does it but explaining those group dynamics to students first would be helpful because you're just like i don't know what to do awkward i guess we'll put it Google Doc together, but we still don't know how to facilitate and have a conversation about the group work of the project out here. Um, so groups are important, and I know socially we need it because we've been on Zoom a lot. Um, shrinking the campus um, for students is so helpful. Um, again, I had big old UW and UCLA, for examples. You all know there's some massive campuses, but even Central and even South, um, helping those first-gen students locate, hey, and most of our classes are going to be on the third floor, BE, this way, um, you know, and the library is right below us on the second floor, and you know, that tutoring floor on on the on the second and a half floor. Um, you all know what I'm talking about. This is your home base. Or I was helping a student um, back on the central campus, um, and I love and actually appreciate this because. Um, She's a STEM student, and so I'm like, hey, you need to know where the STEM B office is at all times. So you need to know where that is. And then it sounds like most of your classes are in the second and third floor, and then you definitely need to know what the SAM uh, Learning Center is. Uh, so the SAM building, that's your home. So she didn't really have to worry too much about the rest of the building, which is a little bit odd, but hey, that's what helps make this place a lot more manageable for you, let's shrink the campus, and just helping students with that. Um, additionally, again, like I had mentioned earlier, explaining office hours to students, it's not an option. It's a resource, please come, and you all, instructors are there, they gotta be there for a little bit. Um, so please come keep us company, but again, um, getting to know that student, giving them options. I know a lot of uh, teachers now, you know, they have, you know, student by week three, you all gotta have an appointment with me. I think that's the kind of thing to do now, which is really great. Um, students are gonna hate it, but again, this is to meet you, physically know where you are, your door is usually open, and how to really navigate office hours. Even for the students, even if you don't have a real question, go up and make a question up just to get brownie points because when the sky falls and it usually falls around week nine, 10 in finals, those instructors are going to remember that, oh, you stopped in my office hours and you asked all those really good questions or this is where you start negotiating for that extra credit. But if they don't know who you are week two, you, they really cannot be helpful week 10, really. Um, introduce students to the resources. I've spoken a lot about that. Um, I want to bring up accessibility uh, services simply because uh, a lot of students have sometimes temporary um, disabilities, aka they broke their arm and they broke their hand and they don't know that, hey, even that counts. You can get accommodations for that because you can't literally write. But a lot of students don't because they're like, well, I was told, you know, accessibility is for this, 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 and this. But my arm is broken. I don't know if they cover that. They, they kind of take care of you. It's a temporary one. Um, I was working with a student last year. And she didn't know. And I'm like, oh, we have to explain these services. Um, allowing for flexibility outside of class. I think you all know life happens. So again, I think Central and South have been great. Life is going to happen. When can we get that assignment? Um, I know allowing for flexible assignments and deadlines has been a hot topic lately as we try to do no harm grading and those kind of new, newer ways of thinking, which I appreciate um, allowing for assignments and deadlines or the deadline after the deadline or whatever the case may be, but I need all this so I can put it into you know the grade book soon. So how do you negotiate that um, for all students, but you know your first gen students who they might struggle over this 10 page paper and this deadline that feels like I can't do it. And so, so a lot of students 
don't do it or they just drop out. And so how do we say, hey, didn't we see that paper? So you're gonna give it to me on Sunday or Saturday or today, please? Um, and checking up um, again, there's a lot of anxiety around deadlines. So how do we ease deadlines uh, or, you know, a sliding scale? Like, hey, if you get it in by this day, you'll get this grade. If you get it in by this day, you might get this. Um, so just negotiating those things. Um, even I think my own learning pattern has changed. I used to be really good about writing essays. And so now I'm more visual out of nowhere. And so um, how can I say, hey, I really would love to write that 20-page paper on leadership and management. Can I give you a, you know, 30 slide deck PowerPoint and present it to you that way because maybe I'm understanding concepts a whole lot better and it's different. Or again, can students choose their own adventure on some of these final projects or tasks or things like that. Um, I think we're all just now learning and really realizing there's just so many more ways that those students and people are just learning. And so how do we accommodate um, and go somewhat different? Um, and then sometimes you just have to be that person for the student. If you're familiar with Gray's Anatomy, uh, it's all about being a person. Uh, and so you always have that person. So students need you to be that person. Sometimes it might be the instructor. Sometimes it might be the librarian. Sometimes it might be that one custodial staff member who is doing their thing and they say hello and they acknowledge and they see you and they're so proud of you. Um, so whoever that person is, you got to be ready because sometimes you just might be someone's person. Um, I have a list of resources that I'll share in the chat box, um, but that is, wow, that is my time, um, and I wanted to make sure this year time I opened up the floor for questions, comments, concerns, or anything that I didn't explain all that great, uh, but that's kind of my first gym story. Uh, insecurity for me, I swear, you'll see the other colorful PowerPoint later, but this was just more kind of from the heart. Let me tell you about my struggles, um, and again, being vulnerable telling my colleagues like oh I almost dropped out of UCLA but I didn't um, and even today I'm a struggling grad student I definitely stopped out aka we don't like to use dropout right I stopped out of my first program because I just knew I could not do doctoral level work I'm in the wrong program but again also pausing to acknowledge this you went through this in undergrad you went through this through masters you can do this um, but life was also happening so giving myself grace and then hopefully I'm back into the next pro another program this next fall. That's the hope. So hopefully you all send me good vibes, but I'm going to shut up and let you all talk to me because it's a conversation. Go. So you all can raise your hand, your hand, hand or your digital hand, or you can type staff in the chat like that if you'd like to say something. I should have put myself on mute. You heard every swallow, but it's okay. Didn't notice the swallows. Okay, there are some chats I'll read while people work up the courage to ask questions. Um, Veronica, who had to go, um, says, your story of perseverance is inspiring. I also appreciate your honesty in sharing your fears and insecurities. I love that. Is Adriana still here? I'm still here. Yeah, do you want to share your comment? I love it. It'd be sure, nice to I'll hear just, your voice. I'll just read it out loud. So uh, your story, Dennis, is just sounding so much like my own journey through higher ed. I was also a first generation student and I can relate to all of those feelings that you had of anxiety, uncertainty, unworthiness, uh, lack of support. Um, but finding that community on campus can be so transformative to our students. Like once, um, so for me, it was, um, I went to La Casa Latina, which was offered on my, my campus as like a Latino student center. And I made so many connections there. Um, you know, they offered some on-site tutoring there. Um, and it was really just a, a place to hang out and um, what a difference that made for me. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, the special programs uh, on campus, off campus, they make a difference. Um, I should have, if I didn't already plug TRIO, I was a TRIO student, so TRIO works. Um, and all the other programs work. Um, again, it really just makes a difference just to find that community. Um, and it's my hope uh, that we continue um, identifying who our first gen 
folks are first gen champions, um, our first gen folks to again have panels, have discussions. Like, yes, I went through the same stress. There's no manual to a lot of this, but we're going to get through it. So, thank you for sharing. Dennis, yeah. I have a question. Oh, no, go ahead, DeAndre. Yeah. Yes, TRIO does work. A TRIO stood myself. Dennis, I have a question. What advice would you give now that you have uh, navigated being a first year student, um, a first year also, um, you know, Jen, but now working in higher education, what would you say our systems, our institutions, what barrier could you see us breaking down right now? You have inside knowledge of being a student, being now in the institution. What is a top barrier of being a first? You know, I got many, but I want to hear your, your opinion. Thank you, uh, Associate Vice Chancellor uh, DeAndre Fisher for that. Um, yes, um, I was going fast. I forgot to talk about it, but this is great. Um, I think some of the barrier, I think if we can, you know, uh, break down or maybe just change up our language, uh, for students. Uh, we use so much of the higher ed lingo, right? Um, and I tip my hat off uh, to folks. Um, you all know I had the pleasure of working with JC Ignacio in our office of student leadership. Um, and they had to remind me like, yeah, Dennis, you know, student, a first gen student don't know what student leadership is. I'm like, oh yeah, they really don't. Huh? Or as we're going through our club or orientation process and constitutions and JC again was just like, Dennis, I don't think of this information it's, it's accessible, uh, lowercase accessible uh, to the students. They just walked off of Broadway, walked up the stairs and said, hey, I want to join a club. What's the constitution? So how do we change some of our language around uh, folks like Dr. Saeer over in BTS, um, you know, I've worked with him previously. We say like enrollment services. And we say that like, we know, we know what it is, but does a first gen student know? No, why, why don't we just call it the place where you go pay bills or, you know, the other words um, to make it make sense for students. So I think uh, one barrier we could use more common, um, not so academic language uh, to just help students. And like, I just need, I just need to go pay bills. Where's that at? Uh, oh, it's right here. And maybe it is called the cashier, but it's located in enrollment services. What is enrollment services? Uh, uh, just helping folks navigate um, some of the language that we're so used to, or we know what it is because we live and breathe this stuff. But um, uh, folks like Sai have helped me kind of rethink like, oh, we should, Really, if we're if we're not changing names of departments or so, come up with a little glossary uh, to let folks know what this really is and what it really does. So yeah. Um, and then I think a follow up to that to thinking of uh, your question, DeAndre. Um, if we all, you know, also could just step back from our roles and our positions and titles um, and really walk into our campuses uh, like, you know, like we just landed from outer space, right? Does this look like a campus? Does this feel like a campus? Do we have signage that, you know, says, hey, um, welcome uh, to college campuses. Um, and so I try to take that kind of mindset every time I walk on campus, um, just for two seconds, like, hey, if I'm just walking by and I'm just so brand new and this is a place of opportunity, do I, does, does this look, um, I can talk about student leadership a little bit. Uh, does this look like a student leadership building? Um, no, but we put a new sign out front, right? Now, I think it looks, you can clearly see. Um, or when you walk in, does it feel welcoming at the front door? Um, and if not, let me send an email to say, hey, can we do something about that front door? Like, what, what are all these flyers about? Or, you know, um, I think we were at the South Campus uh, just yesterday. Um, just making sure the accessibility uh, doors button works. Some do, some don't. Let's go put it on work order. So I try to take a stroll around campus like I'm real brand new, um, just to remember what it is to be like, oh yeah, make sure signage is there, things actually work. When I walk into an office, I do feel welcome. Um, if I don't feel welcome, how can I, can we do something with the lights, buy a tree, I don't know. Um, so I kind of uh, practice that little, you know, mind trick 
at least once just to walk around like I don't know anything. Uh, because of my wonderful boyish good looks, I actually can blend in like a student when I want to. Um, and that has been a wild experiment too. Uh, when I do have my backpack and hoodie on on some occasions, how I'm either spoken to or treated and then ta-da, the hoodie comes off. Oh, Dennis, that's you. Yes, that is me. Let's talk about what just happened. So, um, it's it's I it's a fun little game that sometimes is a little it's a little too fun and also too, a little too alarming at the same time. But that's enough. There's another question or comment there, surely. Yeah, there are lots of folks who put um, comments in the chat, and I okay. welcome any of you to um, unmute and read. Or actually, Rehan has a hand up. I love yeah. to. <laughs> um. Oh, you just re-muted. Oops, sorry. <laughs> um, I'm the intake and recruitment specialist at um, South Seattle College. Um, and I was just listening to your story and stuff and it reminded me of my, um, so I was a student at South too. And like, I think one thing that helped, and I, I mean, obvious, I was still, a fir I was a first generation student, um, but I remember being on campus and then seeing like staff, like one of the staff that came up and was like, I didn't know whether it was a student or staff. And I think that's why like um I was I was never really in, like I didn't plan on going to any student centers or anything like that. And then like the staff always came and said hi to me, talked to me, asked me about things like that. And then um so now being as a worker, I'm like, I like being in the front where I'm like always talking to students and stuff because it's like uh, I think that's what helped me in my role and like becoming like in my role now. Um, but then having like those staff come and talk and like, instead of like waiting for students to come to you, like going to students and like talking to them. Um, I think that makes you feel more, like, it made me feel more comfortable, you know, going yeah. into the student centers and things like that. And so, yeah, I appreciate that. Totally. Just going in, hanging out. How's it going? Ask questions. I know you have to put yourself out there and I know some folks are like, oh, I don't do that. But sometimes you just gotta say, hey, random student in the Wilmington Center, how you doing? I got a flyer. You wanna talk to me for like 30 seconds? I always have like a 30 second pitch or something or the go-to questions. Hey, how are you? Who are you? What are you studying? You're from here, tell me more. And the Gore students are like, bro, I'm just trying to eat my sandwich. Please don't leave, leave me alone, but I'm that person. Yeah. Um, I was also thinking of uh, your your comment, Rihan. Um, I'm on guided pathways, a lot of guided pathways. That's like the buzzword. We say guided pathways. I usually do jazz hands, right? Um, I have my one brain that can give you the institutional answer on guided pathways, but then we started looping in all of these students. And I can't give them that answer. I have to give them a more student-friendlier version of the answer. Um, as we start inviting students to different committees and they're like, well, wait, what is this? And I'm like, okay, this is really good. Um, guided Pathways, we're just trying to help you be more successful. So we'd love for you to come tell us what could we be doing to help you. And I try not to say pathway, to be on the right path. And they're like, oh, well, why didn't y'all say that in the first place? Y'all gave me this big old essay with all these words. And again, me and Kate Krieg at the time, we laughed. Uh, but they had a point where so inside the system, we, we forget how to use other words. Because again, if we were to pre approach all of our interactions, like all of our students are first gen students, we would probably change up our lingo and how we, how we do things. So thank you. You reminded me of that story. Totally, thank you. Alisa, do you want to talk about your comment? Because I love it and so do many other people. Oh, I was just reminded, like, Dennis and I met pretty soon after, wait, were you a pandemic hire? <laughs> I'm trying to remember how long you've been with us, but I, I just remember you and I were talking about how you and I can, like, walk around campus and get mistaken as being students. We've got baby faces, but also our students range in age our faculty and staff also range in age, like we're people of color, like, yeah. So in, in the chat, I was just saying it's, um, first impressions really matter. 
And if we are saying that we're welcoming students, but then we're letting our, our implicit bias affect how we're, we're treating students when they're on campus, um, that can really turn away some people and really discourage people. Um, so I just wanted to bring that up. Thank you for raising that and again, putting that out there. Um, why do we treat certain folks a certain way? And again, because they look a certain way or maybe we didn't see that badge or that ID. Um, I think I was joking uh, this week uh, with my colleagues. Um, I have my beard on this week and I personally hate my beard. It's just, uh, but in new environments, I've conditioned myself. I have to grow it out so I look like an adult. So everyone knows that I'm an adult, a professional, right? And then I went home the day and I sh at least shaved it down. It was longer. I shaved it down because I was like, that's so stupid. Um, I don't have to do this. Like everyone should just respect me <laughs> for what I look like. And yes, I work here the end but again it's like somewhat imposter syndrome on my side but also my campus experiences have been they vary depending on what i wear or what i present as that day so um so just again thank you for saying that and again reminding us that our interactions should probably be one and the same we should be welcoming we should be supporting um and again through conversation and context clues you'll figure out who you're talking to but you gotta build the relationship you gotta get to know them um, my question isn't really always, oh, are you a student? Or actually, it's either student staff. If I can't figure it out, I eventually ask, it, oh, how are you in college? And then they're like, oh, I go here. Oh, I work here. Oh, okay, cool, cool, cool. But that's not like the first question is. It's usually a question, a question. I'm waiting for context clues. And if I can't figure it out, then I have to ask. Um, but little tricks that I've learned in doing this higher ed thing for quite some time. So again, thank you, Alyssa. I think that's a good time to. I mean, there's no good time to end when you have Dennis and all, all of these other folks. And I have to go to another meeting with this Zoom. So Dennis, thank you. And I think I heard you mention like three other COSIs that you, <laughs> that you wanted to engage in with us. And just because you're at South now, it doesn't mean that I'm not still going to send you a ton of emails asking you to do COSIs. <laughs> so as thank you. As you should, as you should. <laughs> Thank you all so much for being here. Um, recordings are on a web page that's linked from the Central Library. Happy to have all of you go back and watch any of them. Um, and we will put the resources in the chat onto that COSI as well. So thanks for um, posting all of those resources, Dennis. And, and slide deck. Yeah, oh, great. Yeah, I'll grab that from you. Thanks for coming. Our next cozy, we have a little bit of break and then I think uh, December something is our next cozy and I'll send a message out. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for spending your lunch hour with me. See you later. Zoom wave.